Those of you who've heard me before know that I say that Lake Forest is the most preservation conscious community in the state of Illinois. And that's attributable because we live in a great place and natural surroundings with history and everyone can be a preservationist. I don't know about you, but I felt kind of underprivileged this week when I walked around Market Square as I felt I was the only one there and the whole community had flown someplace. Uh, but I'm glad that you all could come this afternoon. Uh, the Preservation Foundation has placed great emphasis on working towards uh, bringing West Park into recognition as a treasure. And it's our desire and hope that with the support of people who live in West Park, we can make it a national historical district. The other emphasis that has fallen upon the preservation arose out of at least one event that highlighted to us the significance and importance of Market Square. When Marshall Field sold to Macy's, there were a number of articles in the local paper as well as the Chicago Tribune where people said that they were not going to patronize Macy's because of Marshall Field's uh, love that they had uh, experienced during the century. I mean, I, I can't tell you how long Marshall Field has been there, but a long, long time. And it's a, it, the name is a landmark. And people uh, have felt like they've lost a friend. But when the Preservation Foundation looked at the significance and importance of Market Square to Lake Forest. When you stop and think of all of the things that you love in Lake Forest, it can be the parks, it can be the, the, the lake, it can be the ravines, it can be the trees, it can be all of these things that are important. But if you stop and think about it for a moment, Market Square is the center of Lake Forest the emblem of our community. But we thought it would be appropriate to visit with the official officer um, of Macy's. So we made a great effort to contact uh, people in the Macy's uh, managerial positions to see if they wouldn't have us as, uh, welcome us at, at, the, at an open house in their store for our Christmas party. And those of you who were there know what a great event it was. Macy's catered this from the beginning to the end, including music, champagne, uh, caviar. Uh, it was an outstanding party that they hosted. But the reason they did that and the reason we did it was to say to those who have fallen in love with Marshall Field that that's well and good. But if you stop to think about the Macy store that is there today, it's the anchor store of Market Square. And if we don't support Macy's located in Market Square store, and all of the other merchants who surround Macy's. If we choose to go off shopping someplace else for whatever reason it is, and we don't patronize the merchants that are in Market Square, you can imagine that the preservation of Market Square as we know it and love it could be endangered on the long term. And that experience happened, perhaps Art, perhaps Art Miller will share that with you. 
But when Market Square was first formed, there were some economic difficulties that were in its history. Now, when you stop and look at other communities that surround us, take Deerfield or Highland Park, and if you think that Market Square will survive because of its beauty and our love, perhaps that's not true. And so we felt that it would be very, very appropriate to have this, our meeting on, on Market Square, and in the next few days after this program, we are going to have a newsletter that is going to feature uh, Market Square and historical information that I'm sure you'll hear this afternoon as Art Miller has generously taken time to write all of the material that is found in our newsletter. Now, what could be more appropriate than to have two speakers who love Lake Forest. Uh, Shirley Paddock was born here. And not only does that give her credentials, she has discovered the cabin that was the oldest structure that was hidden. She found the archives uh, on all of the history of, of the development of Market Square in the, under Lackey's building. And Art Miller tells me he's been here a quarter of a century, the librarian at Lake Forest College. And I'm sure all of you know that they are celebrating their 150th anniversary year this year. Without further ado, I'll call on Art and Shirley. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's true, my passion is Lake Forest and I've been researching it for many, many years. And uh, it's kind of exciting because we keep learning new things about it because of the new technology. And at first I used to sit and read all the Lake Foresters page by page and everything and make notes and everything. And then I realized one day that the person who did a lot of real estate in Lake Forest was John Griffith. He started here like in 1904, and the business is still there. And I thought about it, and then I realized that John Griffith uh, never moved. When he did the square, there's still one of the few that are in this very same location that started when the square, square started. So I took it upon myself to call Gordon Lackey and ask if they ever kept any records. And he said, yes, they did. And I said, well, are they available? And he said, well, you know, they're all in the basement. Okay, I said, well, could I go in the basement? He said, why surely would you want to go in the basement? Well, I said, I've read everything I can read, and I realized that you were the, John Griffith was the first realtor. He did work with Market Square and took care of that whole development, and I just thought maybe you might have something. So I called my friend Art and said, I think we have a little treasure hunt. They're going to let us go to see the records of Griffith, Grant, and Lackey at that time. So we got together and went there, and Gordon led us to the back of the office. And not knowing, he stopped us, and then he picked up a trap door on the floor and said, well, there you are. <laughs> and we looked at each other, OK. So we went down, and he leans down. He said, when do you want me to come back? Oh, he said, don't worry about it. I'll check on you. And he shut the lid. <laughs> well, that didn't bother Art and I, because when we realized what was there, our excitement overwhelmed us. And one of the true findings there, uh, one of them is, was a box, an old wooden file box, and in it was the history of Market Square, Howard Van Dorn Shaw's box. And it's a real treasure trove. It's been all documented and um, preserved and everything, and it's a true history of the square. And you, it, things that you don't find in the newspapers and people forget, to, well, they didn't tell people because at that time you don't tell everything. So now it's kind of, you know, archival. Let's turn my notes here. 
also that um, with his uh, Howard Van Dorn Shaw, one has to realize, and we didn't maybe um, know that he had done Mark, uh, West Park subdivision, and they had, and Art will elaborate on this, and they had gone into doing the same sco uh, concept of the square, everybody putting in so much money to develop it. And I put a letter on the backs, 1912 dated, telling you who the investors were, and it also tells you uh, what they were going to pay the uh, Western Avenue Front Street, how much money. It's, it's very unique. It's a very lovely piece. One other thing we found down there, to me, these are, I like the little things. And what I think is interesting is, if you always notice Lake Forest had green, everybody uses green. I call it Lake Forest green. Well, in the archives there, they have letters about painting the square green with the Pratt number that they used. And I always heard the terminology of Lake Forest Green. And that's just a little tidbit. It's kind of interesting because we've always kept, kind of kept that color alive. Let's see here. I think the other thing is that we didn't realize is the people who moved the buildings of Market Square, uh, the local businesses and the houses, most of the square was built by local contractors. And I don't think, you know, we've given them enough credit because they really weren't written up in the papers, but they were all there. There was Niemeyer, there was Griffiths Brothers, there was Henrik, there was um, uh, Pester, for, who was here only a short time. And through these archives now, we can write about these things. And we might learn from their families more history about our square because not everything is always written. Uh, you can find little stories of things, artifacts people would have found. And like, for instance, through the papers there, when they dug the square, we found that what did they do with all this dirt? And I know that sounds kind of funny. Well, nobody really cared. But it's interesting. They took it to West Park. And West Park, if you know where the ice skating rink park, where we flood it every year, they put it there because that was like a lake. And I only got one map that shows that as a lake, you know, like a pond, I don't mean a big lake, but a body of water. And so they fill that in. And that's why when we have the skating pond, water it retains, I suppose, naturally very well there. That's my little tidbits, and now I'm going to turn this over to Art. Um, well, one, th one thing about Market Square is it's been celebrated at different times, but I think this is a great, as Jim points out, it's a great time to celebrate Market Square. And, and its significance uh, locally, nationally, and really internationally uh, for the kinds of things that it, um, that it represents. It was first for some things, and that's, um, some of this information was known when um, the really groundbreaking book about this was done in 1984 by Susan Dart, uh, who now lives in North Carolina. Susan um, published a book that showed took the plans as they existed, reproduced blueprints of that, showed pictures, showed who the original tenants were in the square, talked about Howard Van Doren Shaw, the architect, um, and generally was the first one to really talk about the square's history. Um, since then, uh, well, that's usually when you publish something, it leads to more things being turned out and found out. And so then uh, a couple of years later, um, in 1988, Michael Ebner of the Lake Forest College history faculty uh, cited in his history about when he talked about Lake Forest and, cre and creating Chicago's North Shore, um, he, he noted that the Highland Park paper had made a reference to a town market plan uh, that was reported as, as being done in, in 1912. Well, nobody knew where that plan was. Uh, it turned out that it was down there in that dark basement. Um, what Gordon told us was that they went down in the basement um, twice a year. They went down in December. The secretaries drew straws, and the short straw had to go down and get the Christmas ornaments. And then, <laughs> and then um, after the holidays, when they took them down, they did it again, and another secretary maybe would have to take them back down, down there, because it was kind of spooky. Um, the, the trapdoor filled the entire hallway um, in, in, the, in the office so that if you had the trapdoor down, nobody could get through. I mean, kind of closed, stop business. So um, that's, that's why things were pretty much undisturbed. Um, John Griffith, the um, 
was one of the key players in this. He was a local developer. Uh, there were other major players, um, and, it, and it fits in with the whole history of the community, as the slides will kind of show us, and I think I'll start that. But I wanted to mention these first. Um, a recent history in 1997 by an architectural historian, Richard Longstreth, um, who's been since then a pre president of the uh, Society of Architectural Historians, pointed out that um, it was the first city beautiful town center um, to be designed around motor vehicles. And it was a model for malls in uh, a little bit later in Florida and California following World War I. Um, and uh, then for subsequent developments after that. It was published in magazines after Market Square was done. And it had a big impression. And um, it really was, we said it's the first shopping center, but it was really more than that. It was the first time a town center was planned around motor vehicles, um, cars and trucks. Originally, there was an alley for trucks to go down. But of course, we know that the trucks today could never, they can't even hardly get in the mo into Market Square at all. Um, and so, but the, the original scale of trucks could go through there too, so it was for cars and trucks. Um, it was the first city beautiful town center, Longstreth also points out, the first city beautiful town center to be commercially uh, self-sustaining uh, and uh, paying for itself uh, versus being dependent on tax revenue. Um, subsidized by having a city hall or a library as the main uh, anchor business or, or main anchor building. Uh, this was the first time this has been done. The city of the, the Chicago plan 1909 envisioned big public buildings um, being built and that that would be the organizing principle of it. And those of you who saw the, um, the meeting here in January uh, heard Frank Farwell say that this was the first real estate investment trust. Um, Market Square was um, followed a model that had been followed since the beginning of Lake Forest of really having um, passing the hat and getting everybody to contribute. It was, it was voluntary contributions, but this was before the income tax. There were no deductions for contributions, no deductions for real estate depreciation or things like that. So it was voluntary, but to a certain point. People were told how much they were supposed to volunteer. Um, and if they didn't volunteer it right off the bat, they came back to them and asked them again to volunteer. And they sort of stayed with it until they came across. Um, so it was the, mostly it was the people of the Owensia Club community um, who had um, built their club west of the old part of the town, and uh, they were pretty much assessed according to how they were how wealthy they were considered to be uh, as to how much they should contribute. They 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 ponied up three or four different times before the project was done, and the letter in the back deals with the first stage of um, creating the buying the land, which was the the, the most crucial part. Um, and that was done, and that's what you'll see who contributed for that. Some of those same people that are listed back there also were part of the West Park people who five years earlier had um, paid to have Lake West Park created and subsidized the lots there, and those were all due in five years. So there's sort of a relationship between the two projects. Um, without too much further ado, I think I'll go to turning on the slides and seeing if we can do this with some visual aids. Uh, this is the 1857 plan of um, Lake Forest, and what's exciting about this plan is it was, besides that it was curvilinear streets, the first time on that scale, it had a town center, which was an educational institution. Uh, it had no businesses. Um, they, it was decided that businesses would be west of the tracks, outside of the town, in effect. Um, the t all the roads kind of converged on the depot uptown. And it was almost a gated community. So it's, in a way, it's the first gated community. Um, but, the, but the businesses were outside the town, and they were like uh, places that you just didn't see. They were kind of behind the scenes, backstage. Uh, this is a little bit more close up, eight, from 1861, what it looked like, uh, buildings starting to be there. There were actually a couple of stores that wobbled onto McKinley Avenue. And uh, there was a store there that actually they used to house some of the first city meetings. But um, D.R. Holt, who built a big house on Sheridan Road, um, who was known for his strong opinions, said that he refused to build his house if they had any businesses on this side of the tracks, or I mean on the, uh, on the east side of the tracks. So um, 
they moved the buildings across. And by the, 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 the stores and everything then regrouped on the other side, on the Western Avenue side, um, very soon in the, in the early 1860s. Uh, this just shows the way the open space was in that old central part of town with the railroad track going up and down there. You can see that those were the educational parks and then Forest Park along the lake. Um, the, the town was seen centered on that open space where Lake Forest College is now. It was then Lind University, later Lake Forest University. And the town, um, uh, the townspeople mostly would be uh, developing along uh, Western Avenue. Uh, this is the kind of businesses that sprang up. Some of them were bricks, some of them were wood along Western Avenue. Um, not pictured is uh, there was a livery stable and a catering operation that was on, on right across from the depot uh, or the train station by 1900 it would be. Um, and we maybe all can imagine what the sort of general um, essence of horse that would have permeated the neighborhood would have been if you had a stable right there and little big black flies that might have run around, you know, and nipped at your heels while you're waiting for the train. Um, so it was a colorful area. Uh, this was fine as long as everybody was going east, but when they started going west to the Green Bay Road area and to the Inwensia Club, which the, the Lake Forest Golf Club started out being where the day school is in 1894. 1896, they moved to their um, current location uh, a little bit south on, on Green Bay Road and so people had to schlep past all this stuff to get to um, where they wanted to go that was beautiful countryside. So they began to chafe under that and very soon, uh, 1895, they built the, the building that you see there with the copper covered dome. Uh, 1895, the Blackler building. I think it's likely that this was built by the architects Pond and Pond in Chicago. Then in 1903, way on the extreme right, the Anderson block was built, uh, constructed in 1903 on the corner of other, on the northwest corner of Deer Path and uh, Western Avenue. Um, further north on uh, Western Avenue, uh, you began to have some development. You can see there's a, a, um, a gray frame building that a lot of us remember until just about 10 years ago when it was torn down for uh, Lake Forest Bank property. But those two buildings were built in the, um, in the years after the Anderson block were built, was built. Um, one is the uh, Griffith building, and the other is the Gordon building, I think, on the left. Um, and then it begins to be the edge of Market Square there. But there were some intermediate buildings there. So these were, this was some of the context in which Market Square would be built with these buildings on the north and the Anderson block on the south. Uh, this is another view showing um, what those buildings looked like later. Um, and this is what they looked like earlier. This, is the, this was one of the buildings that was there. Um, now this is, on the right is John Griffith. He had widespread railroad interests and one of the best pictures we have of him is um, traveling out west and he had a little train wreck and here he's pictured in front of the train wreck. But, um, he was very instrumental and very good, really knew the local situation very well, and was very instrumental in making Lake Forest work, Lake making Market Square work commercially. That was him with the kind of broad-brimmed hat there on the right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the train station was on the east across the, you know, on both sides of the tracks, and that was the context there with the Tudor architecture that was built in 1900 the largest um, suburban train station to that time built by Frost and Granger. Now, um, it was built for the Wednesday Club, which started having its horse shows that year in late June. They went from 1900 to 1970, um, brought out huge crowds of people from the city. Uh, I think it was just coincidental that Frost and Granger, who were sons-in-law of the owner of the railroad, Marvin Hewitt, they all happened to live here in town. But be that as it may, they still built the station. That's a joke. Um, this is the <laughs> this is the um, this is the back of those stores that we saw, and there's a certain um, casualness to the way this uh, <laughs> developed back there. It, it definitely uh, there there were this was not the kind of image of Lake Forest that they wanted to project uh, to the new people coming all to town and all the people visiting visiting polo players now. Now this shows from above, and I picked this because I don't really have, I didn't have right handy a, a picture to grab of the City Hall. But City Hall was built in 1899, um, 
in the, uh, up on the upper left there with a tower. Uh, so we had a tower on the Blackler Building. We had a tower over there on City Hall. Uh, and this was all part of the context of what was doing. There was also a city building um, where Southgate Restaurant is now, uh, which I think changed shape over the years, but that was city property. So the, the square was woven in among all these different factors, already, already existing context. Uh, this shows the plan of the square then in that space. Uh, on the left, on the left of the s picture would be the, the uh, um, Walgreens building. On the right would be Einstein's, um, pretty much. On the north would be the big parking lots that we now know, and then beyond that, the Baptist Church. And on the north uh, to the left, or on the upper left would be the, where City Hall was. You can see this plan. Now what's very important to understand is that this is the third plan done over a, a series of years. What's very important is to see that the first two plans involved a very shallow little um, really de uh, development plan for a park. The park was very shallow at the beginning. I'm just going to walk over and point to where the park ended before. So the park only went that far, and then behind it was, a, in the first plan in 1912 called Town Market, there were, on both sides, there were two short, identical towers, very much like the South Tower is today, but quite a bit shorter. Um, and the, the central building was right there up close to the railroad station, and, and more finely detailed, very much in the manner of one of Palladio's villas in, um, in, in Vicenza uh, from the 16th century. Uh, using that as a reference, I think. Um, the, the, the another plan was done in 1914, very much the same, but with, at the, at the north end of this, a library. You see, trying to inject something that would be tax-supported that would help pay the bills and make the thing go. Because they were trying to figure out, and Griffith, I'm sure, was working with them to come up with the right package of rents that would actually pay to have this thing happen. And it's Richard Longstreth, the architectural historian, who explains how revolutionary and how um, clever it was that they came up with the plan in 1915 to push that park way back to the, to the west, uh, it, it, to the top of the picture here, to move that um, villa-type building that was going to be the central building way back. And so that changed the looks of that building quite a bit. It got much more hefty um, pillars that we have there now, the columns that we have are much heftier than they were originally supposed to envisioned to be. There were going to be two levels um, with porches and things and much more finely detailed, but that would have all been lost if you were standing on the railroad platform. You wouldn't have seen it. Um, and the, and the, the buildings used all the elements of the 1912 uh, uh, plan, but pushed them back. And so you got these long, these two long buildings that are informal on either sides of the central building, the north and south buildings. Those came about uh, in this new radical plan. What it did and why it was commercially functional is that it created 300 times as much front footage that you could get top rent for from merchants. Um, and that's why it was uh, able to, to pay for itself. And you can see Griffith's calculations in these files. I'm sure that the big downtown developer, John um, Arthur Aldous, was uh, enthusiastic about all the plans, but it was Griffith who had to really actually rent the stuff, and he finally felt that this one would work. Uh, and that's what's radical about this. This is the first time that something like this was commercially viable, and why it was so interesting to people uh, after World War I, because this was done months before the beginning of World War I. After World War I, when they started developing these things in California around cars and in Florida, um, this was what get, which really captured their attention about the City Beautiful movement, which was a reform idea about central cities, just like in Lake Forest with the shacks coming down and something nice going up. The architecture is very much in the, ca in the range of town planning architecture from the 1880s to the 1910s in England. Um, we've surely found an article, a newspaper article, that points out that, uh, that was in the collection, that points out that the model for it was Port Sunlight, um, a model industrial town outside of, of um, uh, Liverpool, I believe. And uh, Shirley's taken several pictures of that, and there are lots of similarities. 
in uh, not necessarily in scale, but in in the in the character of the plan. So it's quite interesting about that. Okay, so here's what it looked like when it was completed. Uh, much taller towers than originally envisioned, again because of the changes in scale of the park space. Um, uh, very macho columns, uh, Tuscan columns or Doric columns down at the end. And um, colonnade uh, arcade up at the front. There was originally supposed to be an arcade surrounding the park and it only survived on the north and south. Uh, along the street, you had also this kind of English town planning, um, idealistic 18th century almost shop characters or Regency shop characters. Um, you can see there uh, the, where the French is, it's now La Mirage uh, shop, but it was uh, the French drugs, no, not French's drugstore, Kraft's drugstore. Kraft's drugstore, um, when I first came to town in the 70s, um, and he had actually been the only one who'd built his own building. Um, the, the, the Lake Forest Improvement Trust, the people that put this together, were not against other people putting their money in to do this, but he was the only one that came forward initially. They'd hoped to unload the rest of it, but the uh, vicissitudes of mid-20th century finances uh, meant that they held on to it until the 1980s. Um, but that was the one building that was actually built by its owner, but in the plan with the architecture. Um, this would show that at the, um, at the west end was the, 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 the Young Men's Club, which was originally planned to be built next to West Park on the corner of Summit Place and Summit Avenue. Uh, it got built in 1916 on Forest Avenue, I believe that is, um, right north of, directly north of the main formal building west of the main formal building. Um, it's today, it's north of uh, Southgate. Um, you can see it's white stucco, covered with white stucco. Uh, this is a 1917 fire plan, uh, map that Shirley located that shows um, the building, and I think the pink connotes that uh, it's brick construction, yellow would connote frame, is that right, Shirley? Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can see how Market Square fit into all these other features that were already there and um, certainly increased the amount of brick construction in town by a whole lot. Uh, now we can see, here's the picture. So now we're gonna really tour around and see some pictures of, the, of what the square looked, has looked like in the last, let's say, 25 to 30 years. Um, these are uh, 70s and 80s pictures, maybe later, this one is later. But again, what, what the French's store looks like now and Lake Forest Food and Wine uh, apartments were built above. The idea in the arts and crafts era was that the shopkeepers would be able to live above the stores and this would be a much more humane thing than everybody having to commute to work. Um, so people could live right there and their, their work life could be integrated into their um, daily life and their family life and people wouldn't be separated out from that. And so it was a, an idea that, that um, you would bring not only to wealthy people the, the benefits of the arts and crafts movement, but to all the different um, classes, um, including the merchant class. Now this, uh, here's a nostalgia picture for you. Here's a close up of the main building uh, in the 80s. Uh, this, this is from publicity shots for Lake Forest College uh, in our files there. But uh, that sign I believe is now at the Historical Society, right Shirley? The it will be, it's not there yet, okay. Keep your fingers crossed. Um, now here's a view of that same building but from the vantage point of the fountain through the park as it looked uh, basically from about 1940 until uh, 2000. Uh, that 1940 plan had been done by Helen Brown Millman, a landscape architect married to the architect Ralph Millman who did the post office. Uh, but you can see the building there at the end. Uh, this shows you the top of the building, the kind of escutcheon that was up there, sort of very formal thing. And again, this is um, vaguely Palladian in reference. Uh, here's a bit a different view. And here's a close-up of the escutcheon itself <coughs> with Shaw's initials you'll see in there. It's a signed building. Uh, here's the fountain. Notice there's no sculpture there, so this would be before the early 80s when that was when Sylvia Shaw Judson's sculpture went in there. And here it is with the sculpture there, put in in the early 80s. Uh, another view. And this is just from a different angle of it. Um, 
Okay, so this would be the, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the south side, I think. Yes. Okay, good. My angle here. Okay, now we're kind of touring around again, going back along the south side. And notice the rounded tower. Both towers in 1912 were going to be the same scale, but those little tower tops would have, that little helmet there, would have been down much closer to the second floor. Uh, it would have been just slightly raised. Um, there we see it in more detail, and it's at least a story, I would say it's about a story higher than originally anticipated. And you can see the two-story character, uh, the English, uh, but really northern European vernacular um, architecture um, from the Middle Ages on, and this is sort of like on the Romantic Road in Germany or in Alsace, you'd see some of this. But it was adopted by the English town planners at places like uh, Hempstead Garden suburb outside of London, or now in London, um, and in, in Port Sunlight in Liverpool. Here we can see the sort of Queen Anne features of that over the south side. Fred Berghorn, where did you live? Somewhere around in here, right? Not too far? The apartment just to the left of the street. Okay, all right. Uh, this is, okay, this is, a, I got a few dark slides here, but showing the heating plant. Now, they made one major miscalculation, and Fred may have firsthand information about this. They put the furnace for the whole complex on the south. So all the time, the people who lived in the apartments from the, the teens until the 80s um, would be too hot on the south and too cold on the north. Why they didn't put the furnace on the north I don't understand because that, you know, they would have been, uh, then the, the, the people on the north side were absorbing the wind more and it would have been made more sense. So they, they goofed on that. They weren't perfect. Uh, this got converted later, these buildings, uh, and then made a nice little alley out of that where we have an art gallery today and shops and uh, it's turned it, that was originally the truck alley, uh, truck access to the backs of the, of the merchants though. The small trucks, when people had smaller trucks, it became obsolete. Uh, now we're looking at, oh, the other side of the, okay, now we're on the north side of the square. This was originally the post office, but when Ralph Millman built the post office in the early 30s, um, with the best money you could get, uh, federal money, um, not investment money, um, they, that became commercial space. Um, looking further along that space, there you can see this, a sculpture by Sylvia Shaw Judson also put in late in the 80s and a little bit of the North Tower. Uh, there's the sculpture up above. There's the tower top. Um, and this is really a focus of the community. Um, Tom Rakovich can help me on this. Uh, this probably has influences from various things, but there's a certain uh, Christopher Wren sort of character to this. Um, there's also, I think, maybe a bow to the um, to a city hall in Scandinavia that came out around that time that was very simple, very plain on its lower parts of the tower. It also relates to uh, Campanile in Italy and things, but it certainly is an attractive tower. It had a very distinctive feature, instantly identifiable with Lake Forest. And um, one of the things we want to make sure is that this stays stays in the kind of character that it is today, or it has been. It's losing some of the tchotchkes up on top now, I think. Um, there's another view of that side. And again, these, I think this little sequence is going forward in time. And one of these shots is Franz's. This might, Franz may have taken this, Franz Schultz may have taken this view, or yeah, I think he took that view just a few years ago. Uh, okay, here we're going around the square, curling around here to where we have the, uh, the boudoir. And you can see, I believe that uh, Jack Benny's folks lived upstairs in that apartment. Is that right, Shirley? At one point or owned that? They own a business, in the, not in the square, but on the building. Oh, just to the side. Right. Oh, okay. Right. All right. I'm close, but not close enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tower again. I like these tower pictures. Okay, now here's how the... The square, um, the building had, it went through some transitions. The, um, the Young Men's Club building was um, originally owned by the Young Men's Club, then taken over, I guess maybe when they became the old men, 
uh, taken over by uh, the, the city rec department um, when that was organized um, and used in that capacity until the new rec build, no, and then they moved also over to the, I'm a little vague on the history of when that all happened, but certainly by 1984, um, it was becoming office and retail space also. Uh, just to show the detail of the entry, uh, I think this is on the north side, wonderful entry uh, with limestone surround there, or brick and limestone surround, very well detailed. Um, there it shows its relationship to uh, the future Southgate restaurant building. Then it was also, I think, the rec building, rec department. That's a dark picture, I have no idea. Oh, that might be, um, yes, Lake Forest Bank, which continued the same uh, style. Okay, now, um, what was interesting is that around 1980s, and around the time that the Lake Forest Improvement Trust was thinking about the, how they could um, cash out their investment, something very significant happened in the early 80s. Many of us will remember, some of us are way too young to remember, but others will remember that the PC hit and it did something, it was the beginning of um, the decentralizing of business. And so people who'd had to be downtown all the time now could actually have offices in Lake Forest. And there was demand for office space. And those apartments, which had been um, too hot and too cold for uh, the better part of 50 years or so, all of a sudden could be re-envisioned -envi as office space. And so they were thinking of selling this to what eventually, now Broadacre Management was the first owner of it and is the, still the manager of it. Um, and so Susan Dart, who was um, the spouse of one of the beneficiary owners, a, a, a son, grandson of Howard Van Doren Shaw, um, she got interested in trying to preserve the buildings, um, interest people in, in getting them back to, into condition and uh, recognizing how important the square was. So the, this shows her crawling around up on the roof, pointing things out uh, on the south tower, clock tower. Uh, I'm not sure where that, okay, done. oh, there's the tower, but let's see. Oh, they're looking out from the clock and seeing the church that Shaw designed just across the street. He, wa he wanted to continue the same architecture on the other side, on McKinley, but he only got the one building going, and he died in 1926. That building was completed in 1924. Too bad. Oh. Uh, here again is that view from the tower looking uh, toward the main building. Um, again. And here's looking down on the train station and the square as it looked in 1980 uh, at the east end. Now, there were other things that were aspects of this. One of the things that Shirley figured out was that um, almost related to Market Square and just to the north of it, Shaw designed this uh, more utilitarian building as a storage facility for rentals. Griffith had a huge rental business as people would go to Europe instead of keeping their house uh, summers on Wednesday members and they would rent their place out and so they'd move their silver and their best furniture into his warehouse and maybe their clothes while they were off for a year. And then they would come back and get their tchotchkes out and go back and set up housekeeping. So this was a big, shifting things back and forth and storing them was a big business in Lake Forest. Very, a very big business. Several people were involved in it. Uh, and the post office itself, 1931 approximately, 32, uh, federal money, uh, Hoover money I guess that would be, um, built that and that's Ralph Millman and it's in a very different style but Somehow it's blended in over the years so that we now con consider it to be part of Market Square. And just a last reference here to John Griffith, who um, really was, I think, the person who, um, with lots of other people being involved in lots of capacities, people in Shaw's office, uh, the, the, the contractor, James O. Hayworth, um, lots of people were involved, but I think it really was Griffith whose calculations, and he told them when they were ready to go, that they had something that would actually rent to people and, and work in that space. And Market Square was to compete with people buying everything downtown in the big stores and bringing it out on the train. So it had to be very attractive. Um, there was very little planted in the, in the park initially until 1940 because the, the merchants wanted nothing between the people standing on the platform waiting for something good to happen after they got off the train um, 
and them being able to see each of those plate glass windows around there with the things that was supposed to attract them. So all there were tulips, there were elm trees, and grass. That was basically what was there, and a flagpole way at the other end. The fountain was there, but not much of what we would consider to be garden. So 1940, we, went, we ticked up to a little bit more garden activity. And then in, in 1998 to 2000, with Market Square 2000 Project and Rodney Robinson, uh, much more garden feeling to the park. Um, and, but that was a later addition and not part of the original idea. So that's just a kind of a quick uh, view of some of these things. And um, I think we have a little time where, a few, uh, where I can maybe rustle some of us up here to the front if we turn the lights back up. Um, and maybe Fred and um, uh, Franz will come up and help answer questions that you might have a little bit about uh, the architecture, its character, and what it was like to live early on in Market Square. At least Fred can do that part. And Fred actually has a model, not a model, but an artwork based on the measurements of, of Market Square, I think. Isn't that true, Fred? Um, a couple years ago at the uh, Labor Day um, activity, there was a man who uh, uh, was demonstrating uh, models that he made of homes. He came from Wichita, Kansas. In fact, he comes every year with a diff some different subject. And uh, so I had flirted with the idea of making a model of Market Square that I could just have in my house because um, I felt very privileged to have been born and raised in Lake Forest, and I never left. And uh, let me just tell you how that all happened. Um, my mother and father in 1916 got married in Lake Forest, um, and they just happened to rent an apartment when uh, Market Square opened for business and uh, apartment rental, uh, they rented an apartment in uh, uh, above uh, Penny's uh, Heaven or a store that exists today. But just above there is the apartment they rented in 1916 when they got married. Uh, Three years later, I was born in Alice Home Hospital, and they brought me home from the hospital to that apartment, and uh, I lived there for 14 years, and Market Square was my playground, and uh, uh, from day to day, I would explore a different corner of the, the whole complex the roof, the basement, the tower, you name it, I've been there. <laughs> and uh, I got stories to tell about all of that, but I'm not gonna bother you with that, except to say uh, <clears throat> um, the square was quite relatively simple in design when I was young. Um, the uh, center island, didn't have a sidewalk, uh, didn't have any flower beds. It just had the, the, uh, the main features of the fountain and the flagpole. Uh, the rest of it was grass. And the grass was great for playing with other kids uh, from the neighborhood who lived in other apartments. And uh, we just felt that that was our playground. And uh, I never thought too much of it until I'd gotten older and realized what a privilege it was to have grown up in that, in that environment. So I've never left. <laughs> um, and the other day I walked around there just to reflect on what it was when I was a kid. Um, the automobiles used to park parallel to the sidewalk not like they do today. And I thought about that for a while and I realized that in those early days, in the 20s, um, there weren't too many automobiles. Um, 
And as the pressure for more parking space came upon them, fortunately in the design of the whole operation, the, uh, the, the driveway around the island was wide enough that they could go to the type of parking they have today. So they got a lot more cars into the into square that the, than they originally visualized. And uh, many of the pictures that I have, have seen, um, just show automobiles parked parallel to the sidewalk. Um, so over the years I've seen many changes in the design of the island, which I, the centerpiece, and uh, they kept changing over the decades and uh, for good and for bad. For example, <laughs> um, the uh, fountain used to be deep, um, probably three feet deep, two feet deep, at least three feet deep. But then they realized that the kids might drown in there. So then along the way, they filled it with concrete up to the level where it's, there's very little water in there now. But that's one of the changes that I've seen along the way. I remember when the uh, new post office was built and they had a steam shovel that came in and dug the hole and uh, post office moved from where Helanders is over there and greatly expanded with a big building and now we've outgrown the post office. <laughs> anyway, I used to play in, uh, in uh, the uh, rec building behind Marshall Fields. There was a, a basketball floor on the second floor. Um, and there was a pool table on the ground floor. So we'd go in there as kids and play pool or go upstairs and shoot baskets. And, and I remember um, every Friday night they they had a portable movie projector they'd bring out and they'd run movies with Tom Mix and uh, all the cowboys. And <laughs> anyway, um, and over where the um, um, Southgate is now, was the uh, police department and the fire department. And I used, to, I used to spend a lot of time over there. I didn't have any brothers or sisters, so I needed some company, and they were willing to talk to me <laughs> and teach me a lot of things. And I'd sit and watch the public go by, well, joining them. And uh, so then I watched the, uh, the movie theater being built. In fact, uh, before it was built, there was a barn back there uh, that belonged to the Anderson uh, business that it was on the corner. And we found in the barn a box of chocolate. And I never forgot the, the chocolate we enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. They tore the barn down and they built the movie theater. And uh, so I've seen a lot of changes in that whole area. So I'm open to questions if you have any. The mention was made of styles in Lake Forest, and it occurs to me that in the entire Market Square area, there are no modernist buildings. Um, and the styles of Market Square, as, uh, as Arthur pointed out, do uh, go back to a large extent to English uh, antecedents, but also to Northern Europe, as I think he mentioned. He spoke, for example, of the uh, half-timbered look, especially on the south uh, elevation. Uh, and in the north tower, the one with the curves, uh, that goes back in large part to Bavarian uh, city hall architecture. So in that sense, it is an example of eclectic architecture in all of its all respects. There is a step cable, as a matter of fact, I think on the north um, uh, elevation as well. 
And as far as style is concerned, there is no better building in that whole area, in my estimation, than the post office. Mr. Millman's contribution, which is a perfect example, not only of the, uh, the style itself, but of the sort of thing that was being done under the aegis of the federal government at, at the turn of the 1930s. Uh, and the, um, when you go in that building, for example, you'll find, as in the case of Art Deco, it does, it's sort of a, uh, a moment between the old-fashioned stuff, depending upon classical antecedents, and what eventually did become modernism. So when you are inside the, the post office, you can see, for example, pilasters, which are fluted the way old columns would be. There are wonderful um, chandeliers there. In my estimation, it's one of the best buildings in the city. As far as the uh, remainder of the uh, area is concerned that I remember from my own coming to uh, Lake Forest, I do remember steam locomotives uh, on the old Northwestern Railroad. I remember the North Shore, uh, was it the North Shore Railroad? Yes. One of the great losses in my estimation to the, the entire area, which uh, again in the old days could take you not only down into the city but all the way around the loop so that you could get off the, from the, the Art Institute only one block away. One of the great um, Losses, I think, to the entire thing. Now, I think that's a bit it. about it, Arthur. You, you did a very, very good job. And um, um, Jim and Shirley, incidentally, I want to say this. That is a great woman. And <laughs> well, I've, I've, got, I've got to know Shirley through, uh, through Arthur, and I know how much she has contributed to the knowledge that we have now of the whole city of Lake Forest. So salute. Uh, I was raised in Colorado, and I've been trying to think, who was the Illinois senator who joined with somebody in Indiana and put on a television show? Dirksen. Dirksen. Dirksen? Dirksen and who? Charlie Halleck. Dirksen and Halleck. Now, they had a television series that I think they talked weekly. Now, I think... The, the television coverage that we get for these things is fantastic. I hear more people in Lake Forest say that they've seen somebody on the television or whatever it may be. But I think they could commercially have Sally or, or have Shirley and, and Art. We could have a show of Shirley and Art. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. I, I, I heard the t program when I was in Colorado. I knew that, that <laughs> but I, I couldn't think of their names. Yeah, Edward Dirksen and Charlie somebody. Thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm.